What's up, everyone? It's Jason Wojo. I am the host of The Life Inner Show, where we help people create lives they love while working less and making more. I am joined by my co-host, Polish Peter Kolot. What's up? Hey. What's up with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, I'm doing this podcast. I figured uh, nice to see you here. I'm glad you joined us. And I think this is a great one. Well, nice to be seen. And uh, obviously, this is the, the better looking version of the two hosts and uh, the one that's got the, uh, the nicer accent. So, uh, yeah, let's keep going, man. So, so this, is not a, this is not a podcast on psychological delusion. And so we'll, we'll address that in another episode at some other point in time. We'll have an episode on that. <laughs> right, right. This episode, however, is with a, re- a repeat guest. Peter, we have Mike Wagner back with us. Um, if you listened to, and hopefully you heard the first episode we did with Mike, go back and listen to that one if you haven't already. It's a great story. It tells, it tells Mike's, Mike tells his own story about how he went from a full-time physical therapist into rentals and then into self-storage. And, you know, this is something, Peter, I got to tell you, is, is, has kind of fascinated me. And I've started looking at this as an investment strategy for myself as well. You know, in Life and Air, we talk about the four stages of financial prosperity and self-storage is a great potential investment in stage four. And so it sparked my yeah. interest and that's why I wanted to get him back as well as a uh, request from other people as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm excited about this particular episode because I'm kind of looking at this and I'm like storage is, you know, and he mentions it on the podcast is, you know, storage is the sexy thing right now. Right. And why is that? What's going on here? So we're going to dive deep into that conversation, talk about why storage units and what's the, uh, you know, investment and how, what, what's their possible return and all that kind of stuff. So I think if you are considering looking for a vehicle, you should not sure yet what is that vehicle that's going to get you to stage four. This is a great episode to listen to and figure out whether storage investing is the right thing for you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's Let's jump right to the interview right now, man. I can't wait to talk with Mike. Here we go. Hey, Mike, what's up, man? Welcome again to the Life Inner Show. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's been yeah, a while. I appreciate you guys having me back. Yeah, Dude, long time awesome. no see. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, hey, man, listen, um, I'm, I'm guessing that, and uh, listen, I, I, I shouldn't guess. If you haven't, if you're listening right now and you haven't listened to the uh, episode we did with Mike uh, recently, uh, go back and listen to that one um, because it's going to set up a lot of what we're going to talk about here. And essentially, you know, Mike has this awesome story uh, where he evolved from a full-time job and he went to rentals and he went into self-storage and he found his vehicle for freedom in self-storage. And so that's specifically what we're going to talk about on this episode. We're going to get more into the business of storage because uh, this is something that has set Mike free and now he does this for other people. So we got the expert on the line right now. We got the guy who knows the stuff that you want to know. And so I'm really excited for this episode. Um, and Mike, so, t- so tell us first of all, like you went, you went into, you, sorry, you went into the rentals first and then what, what prompted you to actually move into storage? Yeah, I, um, so I started with my rentals in, in 2007, just kind of nights and weekends kind of thing. Um, and over the course of three to four years, I, I built up a decent portfolio and we were making money. It wasn't terrible. Um, looking back, I might've had a house of cards at times where I was a little over leveraged, but, um, not so much so that we couldn't weather the storms. It was just, it was skinny at times I'll say. Um, but ultimately what I realized, and I talked about it on our previous episode with my Costa Rican epiphany, um, was that I wasn't the, the rentals weren't getting me where I wanted to go fast enough. You know, I started out with this idea of a hundred houses making a hundred bucks a month. That's 10 grand a month at the age of what, 24, 25, whatever I was, that was going to be enough. And and it still would be enough to pay all my bills. Um, But that was financial freedom to me. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Peter or or Wojo, but uh, sometimes things don't work out uh, in the real world, like you pencil them out on paper. And so four years in, I was at 31 houses and I was forced to redo the math. And I realized, well, now I was going to need 150 houses to meet, meet my financial goals. And at my rate, even if I accelerated it, I felt like I was 10 years away with that strategy. So I needed to find something else. And that's where I stumbled on storage. And so it was for you, it was more of a financial decision when you looked at the plan rather than like, oh, not another call about a toilet. It wasn't, it wasn't that you didn't like that part of it. It was more financially driven. 
Well, it was actually both because okay. I will tell you the, there are a few things on this planet that get my blood pressure elevated as quickly as someone being unable to pay rent despite having a beer in one hand, a cigarette in another, and a TV that's three times the size of the one I have at home. Right? <laughs> valid, valid. Yes. <laughs> so, so there were, both were contributing factors, I'll say. Got it. Okay. So you ran the math. And by the way, like I, you know, I've, I can relate cause I've, I've made 10 million on paper a hundred times. Um, and so it hasn't exactly materialized yet, but that's okay. So, so were there other investment vehicles on the table, um, aside from storage that you had to decide between? Yeah. So when I came back from that trip to Costa Rica, I essentially, I vowed I was going to make a change. And, and the two things that I focused hard on were mobile home parks and self-storage. Um, because I thought that they offered uh, all the benefits that I knew were available in real estate, including rentals and being a landlord, uh, but they addressed the biggest pain points that I had experienced over the last several years. Um, and, and so I basically put them in a head-to-head -head race and eventually storage won out primarily because um, the, the key component was that it was not habitational real estate. So nobody lives, or at least no one's legally allowed to <laughs> live. are supposed to be living in their units. In a storage facility where even in a mobile home park, even if you only own the dirt, uh, you are still subject to eviction laws. And in the storage world, we have the huge benefit of being governed by lien laws, which are considerably more favorable for the owner uh, than our eviction laws. And so that was kind of that combined with some of the underlying financial um, data, the, the truth is that storage defaults less often, loans that are on storage facilities default less often than any other mortgage-backed asset on the planet, which says a lot about how secure they are. And the reason is because if you take, let's say, for example, just a, a portfolio of apartment buildings, generally speaking, the industry standard is that for every dollar in revenue you bring in on an apartment, 50 to 55 cents of that will go toward your operating expenses, your day-to-day -day expenses. Then with the 45 to 50 cents you have left, you have to pay your debt if you have any, and whatever's left is your profit. In the storage world, the number is 30 to 35 cents of every dollar of income is spent on expenses. So you've got a built-in 20 cents per dollar margin for error. So my joke is I can screw up 20% of every dollar I bring in and I'll still be ahead of the game compared to where I was with my landlord. And so, man, that's, that's so, so let's, so I'm just listening to you already. And this is, I know we've only just started this discussion, but we have, uh, it's more favorable lien laws. It's less, less risk as far as default and mortgages is that your net operating income is, is, is better dollar per dollar than other assets. Um, and so, and also you haven't really mentioned this too much, but it's probably a whole lot more hands off. It is. It, it, and I'm not suggesting that you can't do this in, in landlording per se, per se but uh, I never found a way to do it. Um, and I believe that it's a lot easier in the storage world is where we can fully automate our investments um, to the point where, um, and I want to be very clear, I think your audience is smart enough to know that get rich quick schemes don't work. And this isn't one of them. Um, it takes work. It takes effort. Um, but there is an opportunity to generate a lot of wealth very quickly. Um, and after you've done the hard work, which is usually depending on the learning curve that's in front of you, you know, several months, maybe six to nine months to get smart, buy and find a property and then get it quote unquote turned around, right? We call it an operational overhaul. Generally what we're looking to do is buy an underperforming facility and just use, sometimes we do physical improvements, but more often than not, we're just tweaking the operations. We're implementing systems. So management systems, technology, call centers, uh, boots on the ground to help us do these things. And then it becomes very automated to the point where I have three storage facilities right now. And as stable assets, they require a grand total of five to eight hours worth of work per week from me. And they pay way more than we need from from a living, uh, a lifestyle standpoint, they pay our bills, which which opens me up for all this other time to work on whatever I want, right? Whether it's launching a coaching program to help people do it, uh, hanging out with my wife and kids, uh, spending time talking to you guys on a podcast just because it's fun, right? All of these things aren't possible 
if I'm chasing my tenants for rent and processing evictions and all of that stuff. Man. And so you're, so you, um, your approach is a value add, basically. It's, it's taking something that's not performing. And you mentioned, so it could be, they, they have bad marketing. They have, you know, they're, they're very inefficient with whoever's running the facility. They're, they're using antiquated or no technology or, the, you know, the, so, you're, so you're not just going in there and looking to, to take over an existing asset that's performing. You're going in there for the, for the value add. And, and then that's probably where your, your returns are, are coming in as well. And you can, and, and those, or maybe somebody's uh, not charging market rent or whatever, however, some, a number of assortment of things you're looking for. Um, how, what is the status of the, of the storage facility industry these days? You know, I, I got to tell you, like in, in my area, there's this one road that leads into Raleigh. I live in Durham and there's at least within a, a 10 mile stretch, probably six facilities. And they're, they're big, they're the big box ones. I know, I know. Uh, but I see cube smart. I see, you know, public storage. I see all, all, all the big players. Um, what is, what is the state of the facility right now? Uh, sorry, the, the industry. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And, and, um, it's very important to understand where our industry is as a whole. It's also very important to understand what that means for us as investors. And it probably means different things to me and my strategy of investing than it does to uh, folks who deploy a different strategy, right? Um, generally speaking, storage is kind of sexy right now, right? It's a buzzword. A lot of people are looking at it because of those benefits that I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, and so a lot of the questions I'll get is, well, Mike, I love the storage idea, but if, man, it's oversaturated, you can't find it. My market, there's way too much storage. Um, and there's a couple things at play here. One, what I always tell people is we want to acknowledge and, and, and look at the state of the market, but that's not going to determine whether or not we invest. It's going to determine how we invest, right? Savvy investing investors, sophisticated investors make money regardless of the market. There are People who make money only when the market's doing well are not investors. I don't mean any disrespect to folks that have been fortunate enough to be in that position. I've certainly benefited, benefited from that in some ways. Um, but if that's all you're doing, it's speculation, not investing. Right? So what we teach is uh, how to insulate ourselves from the greater economy and industry as a whole. So the most important thing for, I think, your, your audience to pull away from this is storage is a micro market meaning your storage facility and its performance, the, the performance of that investment is only dependent on anywhere from three to se a three to seven mile radius around that property. So let's say Raleigh, North Carolina, on average has 14 square foot per person of storage. We know, and I'm sharing with you now, that the average is seven to eight square foot per person nationally. So one might go, well, I'd never invest in Raleigh because it's oversaturated. The state of the industry in Raleigh specifically is not healthy. Well, there could be a pocket in Southwest Raleigh where the supply and demand ratio is only three square foot per person, meaning you could double the supply in that small area and have a perfectly viable investment opportunity. Does that make sense? That's man, that's huge. I, I want to pause there. Um, so two things I want to point out. One, it, what I love you said, and it totally just rings a huge bell of truth is it's not, a, it's not a national level thing because lo the investing is local. It's just like when you see like, Oh, you know, housing prices are down and for an investor be like, well, I guess I shouldn't get into housing because you know, well, no, it's, 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 it's so specific to your local region and your, and, and, and wherever you're investing specifically in your niche, but also what you said. And so, um, is that these, this, this local factor, this, this local influence on storage is, is really where people are making their making their investments if if they're careful and doing the research ahead of time. Now you mentioned is seven to eight dollars per square foot like kind of the acceptable range where people think like, hey, at this number, you know, there's supply is equal to demand. Yeah. So so to clarify, it's generally speaking the national average for equilibrium where supply and demand is is in balance is seven to eight square foot per person. Now there are uh, markets that support double that, especially down south. Um, 
But anytime we see an investment opportunity where the supply and demand is above that seven to eight, we really want to dig in and, and ascertain, all right, why can this, what justification do we have that this market can t continue to support a higher than national average level of supply and demand? And I wonder if that's somewhat income generated as uh, income influenced as well, like where people that are more wealthy have more stuff and they need more space. I don't know. So there, no, it's a great question. And there's a sweet spot. There's such a thing as being too affluent for the storage facility. Cause if you've got a McMansion with a 3000 square foot basement, you're never <laughs> going to buy storage facility. Uh, on the flip side, if you're in a, and I will say that I prefer to be in less affluent and I would err toward the side of too little income before I would err to the side of too much. Um, but you're absolutely right. Income level is one of the uh, market considerations that we look at. Um, Generally speaking, population and supply and demand are our biggest drivers, um, but we also look at the types of housing, right? Down south, nobody has a basement. Up north where I live, we all have basements, right? So the, the supply and demand down south tends to be nine or 10, and up north it tends to be six or seven, and that's how you get to that, that average that we talked about. So um, I always caution people, the averages are – and the rules of thumb are a good place to start to try to wrap your head around the concepts, but they're like all rules. They're meant to be broken. You don't want to base your ultimate decisions on those rules of thumb. So I got a couple of questions clarifying that this is, I'm thinking that some listeners on here are kind of completely green to this. So I don't know what the heck are you talking about, right? So the seven, eight square, seven to eight square foot ratio thing. Are you talking about, you're looking at the population in the square, the mile radius and how much storage is in there. And that's how you figure that out. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly right. So let's say we have a rural market where there's a five mile, we've determined based on our mm -hmm. industry knowledge that a five mile radius is what we should be looking at. And we determine that based on where the competition is located and, and, and that sort of thing. Let's pretend there's 10,000 people in that five mile circle. Our industry standard rule of thumb would tell us that that market should be able to support 7 to 80,000, 70 to 80,000 square foot of storage, right? Seven square foot to eight square foot per person within the market. And so then we can just count up the storage facilities. We have ways to use Google Earth to measure how, much, how big each facility is. And we can say, okay, looks like this market has 60,000 square feet of storage in it already. There should be room to add additional storage and not upset our equilibrium. Okay, awesome. That leads me to my second question is, what is your criteria for the storage unit? Like, what are you looking for as far as the storage units? What's the, what is it? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And conceptually, I'll tell you this. I'm looking for value add properties. That's what I teach my students to do as well. Sometimes that's a very neglected property, right? So mm -hmm. it's the, the uh, analogous element in let's say house flipping would be that's the, the cat pee smell, right? That's what we're looking for. <laughs> Something that's just completely been neglected. But to Wojo's point earlier, sometimes it comes in the form of hidden potential. Maybe a property is running 90% full, and so the knee-jerk reaction is to look at it and go, that's ah, already 90%. There's no way I can add value. But if that guy's charging 50% of market rates, it's actually a very easy value add. All we got to do is start raising rates. And as people move out because they're mad, we move people in at the true market rates. So those are a couple examples that illustrate the concept. And that is this. I am looking for a property where I can answer two critical questions. The first is, why is it underperforming? And if I can ascertain to a, within a relative degree of certainty, what the problem is, then the follow-up question and the most important question becomes, can I fix it? Because there are problems that I, as an investor or no investors are capable of fixing, right? If you go into a market that's just been crazy overbuilt and because there was a lot of speculation and people thought it was going to be a boom town and then the oil industry collapsed and everybody went away. Well, you can't fix that. No amount of management or systems or technology or advertising can overcome that challenge. And so that wouldn't be a deal for us. We're looking for the same things we look for in when we buy rental houses or 
um, any real estate, right? It's the, the three or four D's, disease, death, divorce, um, downsizing. Those, those kinds of things are what often lead to opportunity in the storage world. Got it. And now speaking of looking for deals, I know you have a preference of um, location that you recommend new people begin with, like, and you start off with local. How does that work for how, and, and is that something that, um, what, what is your reason for that? And then what, what do people do if they can't find something local? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is, uh, I think your audience will hear life and air infiltrating this response because it is, it is as life and air a storage a strategy as I could come up with. Um, but long story short, we, we always start local because that's the cheapest and easiest place to learn, right? The idea is self-storage is a vehicle to help us create an extraordinary life. I always say that uh, it, it, storage is my vehicle and life and air and my vision are my, my roadmap, right? And so they tell me where to go and storage is just the vehicle I drive to get there. Um, and that's not to say there aren't other equally uh, vehicles that are equally capable of doing that. But it's very easy, and I'll say this, entrepreneurs in general are pretty, pretty, uh, it's pretty common for them to violate this, and especially real estate investors. We all get involved in real estate because we have this idea of the freedom we're going to achieve, and before long, we end up serving our business rather than our business serving us, right? If that doesn't sound like life in there, I don't know what does. Um, and so I always remind myself and my students that we need to keep storage in its proper place. And if we're going to invest as a way to make our lives better, we need to do it in a way that's going to be minimally disruptive to our life. And so the first way to do that is get smart locally. It's cheaper. Um, it's faster. It's more efficient. And then to answer your question, if you don't find a deal locally, that's okay. We've got systems to manage properties. I don't own any properties in my home state anymore. They're all, uh, North Carolina is my northernmost uh, property and I live in New York. Hey, wait a second, man. That's my neck of the woods. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, man, we're finding a ton of opportunity. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama are like, for whatever reason, all of my students are migrating down to that general area. No um, kidding. And they live all of my students live all over the country. So it's, it's just, we go where the opportunities are, but to, to kind of cap add a disclaimer or caveat to that, um, if we haven't found a property local to us, we don't just go, oh, there's not one within an hour home, I might as well search the whole country, right? Because what we wanna do is incorporate our vision into our decision-making process. Life and Air is all about making intentional decisions, whether it's the same decision Wojo would make or Steve Cook would make doesn't matter as long as we've done the cost-benefit analysis, right? And so when I look at a property, uh, Let's say for, and I've used this example before, it's happened to me twice. I own a property in Florida right now. It happens to be 90 minutes from Disney World. The reason being, my wife forces me to go to Disney World for 30 to 40 days every year. <laughs> my tolerance for Mickey Mouse is far less than hers. And <laughs> so I'm making a trip there anyways. It's a lot easier for me to shoot up and do a day's worth of work a couple times a year. And I'm, I'm what I call vision stacking. I'm, I'm, spending time doing this storage thing that I have a passion for because of the life it provides me. And I'm combining it with uh, another vision element. And so anytime you can combine vision elements, obviously that's ideal. The other component is even if we don't have a trip to, to Disney planned, I can get there in a direct flight and I can be down and back in 36 hours. That's minimally disruptive to my life. And it's the most efficient way to create the, the lifestyle I want and make sure that I leave storage in the position where it's serving me and I'm not serving it. And I love that so much. Um, and, you know, as you're talking here, I'm thinking to myself, because, you know, and, and just full disclosure, everybody listening right now, uh, Mike has sparked my interest in storage. Uh, I'm not sure if, if now is the right time for me to do this, but it's a, uh, as he's talking, I'm thinking of like, well, gosh, my, my daughter is in Western North Carolina in college and I like to go out and see her. And so I could look at storage facilities along that route or my mom lives in North Myrtle. And so I could look at stuff down that way. And so I love what you said there, man, because it allows you to kind of still live your vision, not completely sacrifice what you want to do in, in pursuit of the business side of things. Um, so, you know, you mentioned earlier that uh, I think a timeline for, for someone who could take them three, six, nine months to find a deal. Um, 
Would you say in your experience, uh, and I know you weren't officially like a, a big time flipper or anything, but would you say that the, the finding the deal is kind of the hardest part of this whole equation, finding, finding one that's going to give you what you want? Yes. And, and I will say that it's the hardest part, not necessarily because the deals are hard to find, but for the same reason that it's the hardest part in any asset class is that uh, it calls very strongly for perseverance and faith and um, effort despite a lack of visible results, right? Looking for deals for three months can be discouraging if you don't stumble on one earlier than that. And so um, really that, that's where the value of having a coach and the mindset comes into play where um, it, it's good to have someone remind you you know, hey, the roots are growing below ground this whole time, right? So there are results, you just haven't seen them yet. Um, and, and so that's the answer to your question. Yes, it is the hardest, but not because they're actually hard to find. There are, you know, I subscribe to an abundant men, abundance mentality. There are deals I've got, my students and I have bought probably 22 to 24 deals in the last two years. So we're finding one a month amongst us. Some students have bought as many as seven in that time frame. Um, I've got several students who have three or four under contract and are looking to wholesale them. Um, so I'm just helping them decide, hey, who is this deal a best fit for? Either within our program, which is always my first choice, or outside of it to folks that um, maybe aren't in the program, but just offer a good end buyer for my student who's looking to make a wholesale fee. Um, and I've got some students, they're rock stars. They can find deals way better than I ever could. Um, the beautiful thing is it's a very low volume, high margin strategy that I teach anyways. Um, I've been doing this 10 years and I'm on deal number five. So this isn't the, a lot of times when real estate investors are coming from the residential side, they have this, this idea that they've got to find a deal every three months and it's got to keep going. But the truth is one or two well-placed deals can be life-changing and you might not ever have to do another one beyond that. Uh, I find that most of us do because there's a, a degree of addiction that comes with, you know, the hunt and the finding the deals and all that good stuff. Um, but really it just comes down to, um, to me, the key is consistency over time rather than super excited for three weeks and then I'm going to give up. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it's that unwavering belief, hell, El Rod, the miracle equation, right? Um, I know I have the ability to achieve it and I'm not going to stop until I do. The inevitable conclusion of you applying those two beliefs to your life are that you will succeed. Right. Man, you know, I, I, I gotta tell you, dude, I, so my first flip, so I had the full-time job. I wanted to get into real estate investing. My first flip took me 82, like literally 82 offers. And Steve Cook was my coach. And I remember going to Steve and saying, you know, after offer like 50, I'm like, dude, this just does not work. He's like, trust me. To your point of having a coach, someone to kind of keep, keep, like, put, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep encouraging you. He's like, keep trying. I get to 75. I'm like, Steve, I, I'm like, I, I'm, uh, listen, I, I trust you, but I'm just telling you it doesn't work. And wouldn't you know, 82 offers in, I got that first deal accepted, um, made half my year's salary in that first flip. Now the second one, I got better. And so it took me around 40 offers. Third one is down to like 25, like, and so you get better. And so, um, so for, for everyone listening right now to Mike, um, I, I don't think it can be overstated. What you're saying is just so, so true. Um, and you know, I look at, I look at many things in my life and it's been the same exact lesson. Like, you know, especially, uh, if, if you feel, you know, uh, that this is something that you can do or you've seen other people do, there's no reason why you can't do it either. You just gotta, maybe you're just gonna have to try longer, but eventually something's going to give and it's either gonna be you or it's going to be, you're going to get that deal or you're going to get that offer in accepted and, and get that facility. So that's awesome, man. Um, that's so true. So I got a question for you, Mike, and um, <clears throat> I'm still a little bit kind of on the whole thing when Voja was talking about where he's looking at the facility by his daughter and by his mom, but he didn't mention about looking at the facility by his best friends. But uh, <laughs> hey, I, I don't know how I'm going to handle this, but uh, I'll, I'll get over it. So my question for you is because I think a lot of some listeners on here, the next thing that probably in their head is like, 
wow, okay, storage facility sounds good. Looks like this would be a good investment, but that sounds like I need to invest a lot of money into this because this is not a single family house, a storage facility is probably a few million or whatever. I don't have that kind of cash laying around. What's your answer to that? Yeah, there, and there's a couple good answers to that. Um, I'll share one, my personal experience, um, and, and I don't mind talking about the resources I had to uh, invest into each of the properties I bought. Um, it's changed over time, but my first property, I, I invested $40,000 of my own money. Um, I borrowed 60,000 privately, and then I also got a bank loan for 250,000. So it was a $350,000 property. Um, as a quick aside, I sold that property a little under two years ago for 1.8 million. Um, I had spent some money expanding it, but the, the overall profits on that very first deal were 1.5 million when you count cash flow and equity. Um, so 40K is a lot of money to your point. Um, I've since invested in deals where I've put down as little as 5,000 on a $500,000 property. So that was 1%. I will be the first to say that my track record on that first deal and a, a subsequent one uh, were what allowed me to get in so, with so little skin into that, that one that I just mentioned. Um, and so I will say that no money down deals are the exception rather than the rule, or at least that's what I used to say until I brought Ken Holmes into the storage rebellion and started teaching him what I know about storage. He overlaid what he knows about debt-free investing and he's now in the process of purchasing his fourth property with no money down. And we're talking about, just to give you a very quick numbers so you understand, we're not talking about uh, little entry level properties that might not be worth their time. He bought a, a $400,000 property that's now worth 1.2 million. He bought a $200,000 property that we're actually under contract to sell for four, I think 435 later this month. Um, and more recently, he bought an $800,000 property, all no money down. So he's literally like flipping it, wholesaling it? What's no, it he's it? purchasing and owning those and he's joint venturing. He's raising all the funds to purchase from uh, equity investors and then he's splitting the profits, both the cash flow and the equity on the back end uh, with his investors. I've done similar, but never a straight JV. Usually what I've done is uh, use a bank loan and then raise the down payment and share some of the equity uh, with those investors. And, and um, all of these strategies are possible. Um, I would say my, my quick answer to your question is, it's a valid concern. I always address it with my students or anybody I talk to for that matter. And I don't wanna come off as dismissing it, but I do believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you find a good enough deal, you'll also find the money. And I can, all, I can all but guarantee that. And the reason I guarantee it is if you don't find the money, I just say the deal wasn't good enough, right? But <laughs> the truth <laughs> is, if the deal's good enough, you That's can true. split up the pie. You don't need, what do they say? Uh, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, right? You don't need to be greedy. Ken's investors are very happy with the results they've received through his investments. Um, and so they're perfectly happy that he didn't have to put money down into the deal. He's doing all the work. Yeah. So Mike is, so, you know, <clears throat> so I've, um, and we'll get to this later, but you have a, you have a community and I've referred a few people there, um, and they've been poking around and, and they've started looking for deals and I'm, and they're, they're reaching out to me like, man, I can't find anything under a million or 1.7 or two point. And, and they're, they're having a hard time wrapping their mind around these deals and these numbers. And so should they be looking for somebody, for somebody who's new, should they be looking for these $200,000 deals, $400,000 deals? Cause that's much more in alignment with a flip or maybe an expensive flip, but nonetheless, it's not multi-million dollars. Um, should they kind of, should, and, and does that correspond to any kind of square footage? Like what kind of, what's a good solid, you know, size and price range for somebody who's looking to get into this? Sure. Generally speaking, what I recommend, and this is a rule of thumb, this is uh, a generic answer that applies to many, but not to all, because it, it simply comes down to people's objectives, their risk tolerances, and the resources they have available to them, right? Uh, because the truth is a smaller property uh, that fits this value add strategy that we deploy takes about as much work as a much larger property. But the much larger property is going to bring with it, if we're, our goal is always to at least double the value of the property. If you spend X amount of time doubling a $200,000 property to 400, 
you could have made considerably more money by spending the same amount of time doubling a $500,000 property to a million. But there's potentially higher risk, potentially more resources required, uh, potentially less sleep at night, right? All of these things are considerations. Um, so it's always an individualized answer, but I will say that I found the sweet spot through all my students that usually were between the 200 and 500 range as a first deal. Uh, as the examples I used with Ken, he, he graduated up out of that. Um, but there's a couple things at play here. Uh, one, it, it's, it feels closer to folks that are new to the industry. So that absolutely comes into play. The second element is more of a supply issue. If you think just kind of common sense wise, it's l much less likely for someone who owns a two or $3 million storage facility to neglect it to the point where it's worth one to 1.5 million, right? Generally speaking, that's, there are exceptions to that rule. And if you can find those ones, by all means, we want, we want to dig those ones up, but it's far more likely for someone who has a four or five, six, seven thousand dollar facility to allow that to neglect that to the point where it, it can be bought for 50 cents on the dollar or less. Does that answer the first part of the question? Yes. Okay. Um, and then secondly, I will say um, you had, you had asked about the uh, you know, size of a facility. Again, take it with a grain of salt. It's a rule of thumb made to be broken, but generally speaking, we're finding our value add opportunities. We're purchasing them somewhere beneath $30 a square foot. Sometimes it's 33 or 35, but generally speaking, it's in that 15 to 30 range because we know once we fill them up, stabilize them, we can sell them for 40, 50, or even $60 a square foot. And how about for like, you know, uh, how, as far as size of a, uh, of a facility, like 10,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, 20,000, like what, any general recommendations there or is that all over the place? So the biggest thing to keep in mind, it, it can be all over the place. Again, it's going to be specific to the individual and their objectives and tolerances and whatnot. But the critical component for folks to keep in mind, and this doesn't mean that you can't buy one smaller, but around the 10 to 12,000 square foot mark is when the economy of scales start to tip in our favor. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we spend 33 cents of every dollar in revenue that a facility can generate. We spend that on our operating expenses. Well, that's assuming we get to the economies of scale of a 12, 15, 20,000 square foot facility or larger on the smaller facilities, six, eight, 10,000 square feet, our expense ratio might be closer to 40%. Just because you have some fixed costs like insurance and property uh, taxes that, that don't grow as quickly as the, as the revenue does when you start looking at these bigger facilities. I've had students buy five and 6,000 square foot facilities my recommendation is usually, and it's a conceptual one is, you know, is it worth owning at that size? And if the answer is, well, no, the cash flow would only be 1200 a month. It's 1500 a month. It's not going to be, it's not the life changing deal I'm after. Well, then the question becomes how confident are we that we can double it in size? Because if we're tapping into some expansion, there's a lot of equity to be made there. So I had a student, he's actually a life and heir do just that. He bought a property down in South Carolina, 5,000 square feet and he instantly doubled it in size to actually more than doubled to 11,000 square feet. And it's got room for three more expansions, each of 6,000 square feet, if the demand is there in the market. So by, um, by phasing the investment into, uh, into phases, <laughs> as the name would indicate, we're, we're able to mitigate risk and, and um, extract the most ROI out of a deal without overextending ourselves at any point along the way. Got it. That makes a lot of sense, man. That's huge. Um, you just mentioned ROI and speaking, and that's just return on investment for those people who aren't familiar with that. One other indicator that I've heard you use before in terms of uh, a, a report, I don't know if you want to call it just a ratio basically is, is cap rate. And I've heard you talk about evaluating the, uh, or, or yeah, value, make an evaluation based on a cap rate. What is cap rate? Yeah. And cap rate. First, I want to say, if you don't understand what a cap rate is, even after I explain this, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, what happens when you talk to a girlfriend? So I mean, is this the conversation? That's it's not, not you, it's me. me. <laughs> yeah. Breaking up with somebody. 
Uh, well, so here's the thing with cap rates. Cap rates are a way for us to um, evaluate properties that might be in different markets. Um, and it's, it's strictly an income-based valuation of a storage facility. And that's, you know, this isn't like the world of residential houses where we look at comparables for sales. Uh, that is part of it. But in, in the world of storage, it might be 5% of the equation. The value by and large of a storage facility is derived from the income that it generates. And so when we look at a cap rate, it's the, what a cap rate means is if you were to buy a storage facility, the cap rate is equal to the ROI, the return on investment that you would realize if you bought it with absolutely no debt. So let's say you bought a million dollar storage facility and it returned to you $100,000 in profits each year. That would be a, represent a cap rate of 10. You're making 10% on your money. You spent a million to buy it and you are realizing 10% return back each year. Um, so that's, that's what a cap rate means. How we utilize it is probably a discussion that, that would require more time and mental energy than, than people want to dedicate to me right now. Um, I, I always encourage folks to start with a whiteboard video on YouTube on how cap rates work um, because it is, it's critically important to understand. It's just, it can be confusing because there's an inverse cap rate between valuation and the cap rate. So as the cap rate goes down, the value of the property goes up. Returning to our last example, if you're willing to accept a property that has a five cap, which I am not by the way, but if you were, that million dollar facility is only gonna return you 50 grand a year, as opposed to the 100 grand a year if it was at a 10 cap. So there's a, a division of the variables that we utilize to parse out that relationship. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely probably a discussion. Maybe they can learn more over uh, uh, in your, in your uh, community. Um, because I could see like on, on, on paper, you want to get the best cap rate you can, but at the same token, you mentioned undervalued or underperforming assets. And maybe on the surface, it looks like it's a five cap rate, but gosh, you do the research and it has the capacity to become a 10 cap rate with some work and some, some creative uh, restructuring or whatever. And so, so that's, yeah. So, so that's awesome, man. Um, and so let's, let's assume that someone's found a deal. They've, they've found, uh, they've, they've identified where this can be improved. They close it, you, you buy it and you do the work. What is, what is, um, what's the, what's the average amount of time someone can plan on? I'm assuming that, that, that period of, of renov, I don't, I'm going to say renovation, but it doesn't necessarily mean renovation. They're, they're, they're fixing the problems. Once, once that's done, what on average, you mentioned you spend five to eight, sorry. Yeah. Five to eight hours per week on your three facilities. Is that typical? And are your facilities managed by you, by somebody else? Is it all remote? Is it all digital? Is how, what is, what is, what do you recommend people to do? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and um, I'm a big fan of, of when I buy a facility of putting my foot on the gas. Uh, I have, I think, a blog post somewhere out in cyberspace about my four day operational overhaul, where we took a property that was literally neglected for four years. I went down there, slept in the office on an air mattress with sheets that I bought at Dollar General. And it's Florida, so there were what they call palmetto bugs. I call them cockroaches. It was gross. <laughs> Um, but I rolled up my sleeves and I just, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do that dramatic change. So I worked 16 hours a day for four days. This was back in April of 2018. And I've been back to that facility. I haven't been back in over 18 months now. Um, and I think I've probably been there five times. That property's worth a million dollars more than I paid for it. And um, it takes very little effort to run after that initial overhaul. Some folks are a little less manic <laughs> than I am. And so they might make a few trips over the course of six months. I always tell people to anticipate needing to visit a property once a month for four to six months. And then maybe once a quarter for another, uh, or I'm sorry, once every other month for another six to 12 months. And then once a quarter forever more. Again, oftentimes you don't need to but you need to understand, I want that to be icing on the cake. If, if your systems are so good that you don't ever have to go there, we don't want to set that as an expectation because then, then we're just disappointed every time we have to make a trip there. And that's not what we want. 
So those are the rules of thumb I, I lay out for folks. Um, once you're up and running, we have a three pronged remote management strategy that is what enables me to spend between an hour or two per facility per week. And my involvement is forwarding emails, maybe once a month jumping on the phone with a customer to argue about a refund. More often than not, I just, uh, I, I decide not to throw good, good time after bad money. And so I just have uh, my, my call center do the refund. But occasionally I have to work out uh, customer service issues myself. Um, so one to two hours a week per property. And the way we do that is a, rem, um, a web portal where folks are able to uh, rent online, pay for their storage, uh, add units, change their address, basically a, a self-service option for them where they never have to talk to, to me or anybody at our facility um, and they can handle everything they need to. They can schedule move outs and, and whatnot. Um, to address the idea that some folks either aren't comfortable or just don't want to do their business online, we do have a call center that we employ. The beautiful thing is the call center is embedded in the back end of our web portal, which also doubles as our management software. So all of these key elements to running a storage facility successfully are integrated seamlessly with one another. Um, and so the call center can then handle Anything the internet can't, I have to step in that one or two percent of the time to, to do some things. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle is our, what I call boots on the ground. This is somebody locally, whether it's your daughter because you bought near her college or someone you meet in the process of purchasing, as is my example in Florida, um, who handles the physical on-site tasks. They're very minimal, usually two to five hours worth of on-site activity any given week. Um, we don't pay hourly. I pay based on a flat fee for these folks. The beautiful thing is it's so little work and it's so easy. It's, it's 10 and $12 an hour work, but because it's so little, I can, and, and storage does so well financially, I can afford to either double or triple pay my help. Again, I'm not paying them actually hourly, but if you broke it down that way for the time they spend, I might be spending anywhere from, two to six hundred dollars a month on that service and if you break it down they're getting paid 30 35 bucks an hour one might ask mike why on earth would you do that well that extra twenty dollars an hour is for my a plus player who's going to take ownership of the facility i don't when i hire somebody i don't teach them uh, i don't tell them that i need you to sweep out units i need you to cut the grass i need you to put out the pest i need you you know those are all things that they have to do, but that is not their identity as, as my boots on the ground. Their identity is wrapped up in this. And I use this every time I hire somebody, I tell them that I am looking for someone to treat the facility as if they own it so much so that I can forget I own it. And none of my customers realize that I've forgotten. And if they awesome. fill that role for me, like th that's what takes storage from the A minus, holy cow, this asset class is awesome to pinch me. I'm dreaming. There's, this is too good to be true. If you can get that A plus player, that's, that's what you're paying extra for. The truth is you could survive and get by with a C plus player in that role because it's not rocket science. It's just, they're not going to take the initiative to handle stuff before you're made aware of it. And that adds to, you know, you might go from one to two hours a week of, of personal involvement to two to three hours. I'm willing to pay a boatload extra to get that down to darn near zero if I can. Got it. And for you that, and that those, that still works with your numbers of the 30 to 35% of your CapEx expenditures for your, for yeah, your yep, expenses. Absolutely. And, and, and because if you think about it, normally, uh, there's some efficiencies that we tap into by having multiple roles handled by the same person. Um, if you have to pay someone to drive their lawnmower to your place and mow your lawn, and that's all they're going to do, well, you're paying for their travel time. If you have to pay a pest company to come in and lay down bait for rodents, well, you're paying for their travel time. If you have to, right? And if if you can pay one trip fee and have someone take care of six tasks all at once and they just stop out once or once a week, twice a week, sometimes, sometimes once every two weeks and do what's necessary. 
you're going to save enough to justify overpaying them. Have you had, do you have any tips for someone trying to find that person? It, that is a very common question. And I wish I had a really profound answer that made me sound really smart. I'll be honest with you. The last dude that I hired at my North Carolina property was a result of me having called the police on him. <laughs> okay. It's more of a story that I'll go into, but long story short, we bought this abandoned storage facility. And one time when I went down there, there was a truck there and I'm like, well, we're still under construction. I'll figure it out next time. And I went back two weeks later, the truck was still there. So I eventually called the police. And long story short, the guy's truck had been borrowed and not returned. So not quite stolen, but kind of. And it had run out of gas there. And the people who borrowed it just flaked on the guy. So the police brought him to the facility, literally in the back of the police car. Now, he wasn't under arrest, but that's how they got him there. And I, I ended up taking him to the gas station to get him gas. We struck up a conversation and then we entered into a very informal, what, and what I always recommend is a probationary period where we're not signing contracts. We're not, we're just, we're coming to an agreement on how we're going to test drive this relationship. And then we're going to see how it goes and we'll evolve the role or eliminate him from the role. If it doesn't work out well, uh, my guys, he's been great. And all of the people I've found, what I always recommend you start with is start with vendors that you're going to need anyway. So I usually start with my landscaper. You find a mom and pop landscaper who, and you have three or four of them interview for the job, right? Really what they're doing is giving you a quote to mow the lawn, mm -hmm. but you're converting that discussion into a, Hey, would you ever consider adding these? You're already here or your guys are already here. Just walk around and count the locks. And if there's no lock, lift it up to make sure it's empty and rentable. We call that a lock audit to make sure our online inventory matches our physical inventory on site. So that if someone rents online, when they show up, the unit's available for them. Um, more often than not, they'll be open to some degree of extra tasks. And then we just add on as, um, as appropriate until they're filling as many roles as, as they should. Man, that's awesome tip. And, uh, and I love, it. it's just, it's just, it's so, so indicative of your kind of creative way of viewing this business and some of the little tweaks and things that you've learned through time. Um, and I want to talk about your, your, um, the community in just a moment, but before we talk about that and where people can find out more, is there anything on this specific episode that you feel like we didn't address in regards to storage that people should know as a general overview? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, well, one thing we didn't touch on in the conversation about cap rates and, and the reason that it's okay if folks don't have a huge handle on it, you want to get a good grasp on it as time goes by, but I don't want that to feel like a barrier, like, whoa, this stuff must all be over my head. Because the truth is cap rates fall apart on these value add properties. Mm. As an example, the first property I ever bought, I bought for $350,000 but it was only generating $10,000 a year in profit the day I took over before debt service. So you look at whatever that, that's a cap rate of two. To your point earlier, Wojo, what I was looking at is, hey, at the end, it's gonna be worth, at the time I thought 700, <laughs> ended up being considerably more than that, but that's what we looked at. So really cap rates fall apart when we're evaluating a property, and they're really just a, um, to me, they're subordinated to several other metrics that I use to gauge the health of a storage investment. And that's the kind of stuff that, that uh, we end up spending more time on. Got it. Got it. Great point. Thanks for that clarification. So I know clearly we could never do this industry or your experience in it justice in, in just a short podcast episode. Let's talk about your community and how people can find out more about what you're doing. And if they want to investigate whether this is a, a viable option for them, a vehicle for them to achieve their freedom and their vision. Like how can people find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, I would absolutely encourage anybody who has even a, a vague degree of interest to dip their toes in the water. Um, I'm, I'm in a very fortunate situation where my storage facilities pay my bills. And so my coaching uh, business, as well as this community aren't revenue driven. It doesn't mean I don't make money doing it, uh, but I don't need to make money doing it. And, and so it it allows me to uh, make good on what my highest value is, and that is stewardship, right? I want to pay forward all that I feel fortunate enough to have been blessed with, whether it's time, money, experience, knowledge, et cetera. 
Um, and so toward that end, I got to design my community in a way that empowers folks who, who might not need everything I have to offer to, to take as much as they do need and then go succeed with it. And so the, that's a long way of saying I have a website, uh, it's called members or the, the domain is members dot the storage rebellion.com. And, uh, it's a free community. It, I'm guessing most of our audience is familiar with bigger pockets. Um, and the way I describe bigger pockets to my non real estate friends are, well, it's kind of like the Facebook for real estate dorks. Uh, what I've set out to build with the storage rebellion in my community is the bigger pockets for storage dorks. So that's where we all go. We just hang out and talk shop. It is an absolutely incredible collection of people who all subscribe to the rising tide lifts all ships kind of mentality, all sorts of abundance mentality to be seen people sharing. Um, and if folks are interested in maybe going one step beyond that, there is a, when you sign up for that community, which there's no cost for, um, there's a seven day workshop where over the course of seven days, I'll give you, uh, basically expand on some of the stuff we touched on here, but spend an hour or so on each of the most critical steps required, uh, if someone decides they want to walk down the storage path. Man, and I'll tell you for anybody listening right now, um, Mike directed me to the seven day course as well. And I've gone through it. It's phenomenal, man. You did a cr incredible job, like really, really solid stuff. Um, and I want to thank you for that because anybody who listening this, that would be a great, great start to get a little bit more in depth uh, overview of, of what this whole thing is like. And regarding your community, I know a lot of the people in there and they're just awesome people. And I seek discussions over there like, Hey, who are you guys using for this? Or what do you guys recommend I should do for that? And everybody's just helping each other. And it's just so, so, um, synergistic. It's, it's great to see people with that level of, uh, not only expertise and experience, but also, um, people that just want to help and see other people succeed as well. It's, it's, you've really created something special over there, man. And so, uh, my recommendation for anybody, if this is something that might interest you, go on over and check it out. Uh, Mike's in there as well. I see you posting over there all the time too. So you can, you can ask Mike questions as well. And we're going to talk about, uh, uh, some other things like that, uh, as well. When we get to the, uh, discussion about Mike being in the life in app too. And so Mike, I really want to just thank you for, for being part of this episode, sharing what it is that has set you free, because I know a lot of people sometimes are like, Hey, you know what? I've set myself up. I don't want to share this with other people and I want to enjoy this for myself. And, and you really have that opposite mentality of just like the more people you can bring along your journey, the more people you can help, the better it is for you and the better you are living your vision. So I want to just acknowledge your heart for people. And, and, uh, really I'm very grateful to, to have you, uh, on the show and consider you a friend as well, man. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. And I owe that to life. And someone once told me within the life organization that you can't out give the system and I dare you to try. Uh, so that's <laughs> what I'm doing. And it, so point. far it seems right. Love it. Thanks, man. Awesome, man. Thanks. Man, that was awesome. I got to tell you, I, uh, I really enjoyed Mike sharing and I think he, he shared some real concrete things. We, we kind of got into a little, I wouldn't say we got into the weeds, but we got into the real things. We talked about numbers. Like how do you tell if an area is, is, is suitable for storage? What are some of the factors to look at in a potential property? Um, what to, what you can expect to pay, how to fund these things. Like we got into some real specifics that I think our listeners will really enjoy. Yeah, and I think he gives some really good meat on there, you know, as far as like he gives some really good rule of thumb, right? I said that right, right? Rule of thumb. Uh, uh, it sounded <laughs> like he said rural thumb, but I think it's I It's the thumb, see, like those of you watching on the video, is it thumb yes, on the video? Yes, the anyway, rules of yeah, thumb. So rules of thumb, yeah. And to be able to start looking at this thing and actually start, I would encourage you guys to go and, you know, go check out his, the members area, right? Go look yeah. and see if like, is this something that would be really beneficial? Because from what he's saying, there's a lot of upside to it. I know we didn't dive too much into if there was some kind of, you know, the risks of it and all that kind of stuff and any kind of investment is a risk, right? So, but I think that's a great opportunity to go and start investing, especially if you hand, hate landlording. I think this is a great opportunity because that's what he did, right? He didn't like the landlording part and this is an, an uh, opportunity where he actually started and is able to get some cash flow and income and without having to do all of the headaches. Well, one of the things that, that really struck me is like he used his vision 
as one of the screening criteria, one of the tools for him to decide that this is what he wanted to pursue. So for him, he looked at the numbers for rentals and he realized like, hey, you know, gosh, I'm going to need 150 doors. And he, you know, he didn't want to be a right. landlord of 150 uh, properties and the headaches and the and the hassles that go along with that. Plus, he mentioned like some of the challenges of just being a landlord in general with having tenants uh, for him. Right now, some people, by the way, we've had other people. We've had, you know, Josh Girak on this and he has apartments on Zep, on the uh, on the Life Inner Show and he loves it. And that's his thing. And so what I want to really um, highlight here and emphasize is that for some people, Storage may be great for other people. It could be apartments. He mentioned doing um, uh, mobile home parks, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, and we have uh, Doug Ottersberg, who is an expert on that. And we have an episode with Doug Ottersberg on on mobile home parks. And so, like, there's all kinds of different investment strategies, but you got to look at what you want. Uh, in terms of the finances, of course, but also like, what do you enjoy? What do you what do you want to do? Right. What does your vision indicate? Uh, both in terms of like the return and what you enjoy, but also like, you know, is this going to give you the life you want? Right. I think that's a really important thing to consider. Does this align with your vision? Right. That's who you are as a person. Because some people, you know, the real estate is a great vehicle to get to stage four, but it is not for everybody. You know, because some people are literally, uh, they can't deal with that, right? So looking at that particular aspect, who you are as a person, and does this align with my vision? I think that's what I do with my my students. And for Mike and for his students, this vehicle aligns with their vision, and that's why they're able to actually make it work, I think. Well, yeah, and it, it aligns with their vision and they enjoy it, right? And it yeah. doesn't feel like work and they get to do it. Mike talks about that in the, a lot more in the first episode we did with him. Um, but that's, that makes a huge difference because you're never going to be successful at something you don't enjoy uh, because somebody who does love it and, and, and just and feels like they get to do it versus has to now is going to be, is going to be kicking your butt all over the place because they're going to, they're going to be just more successful at, than you. You know, I remember, uh, and I've shared this in the past, like, for me, being uh, before my uh, my my reinvention or my evolution into what I am now, I started off as a as a scientist. But I was never the guy to go home and dream about hypotheses and and theories and experiments and like this didn't consume my every waking thought with joy. Mm -hmm. And but guess what? And that's why one of the reasons why I got out of it. But someone who did think that way was gonna was gonna be super successful. And so that's what they enjoyed. And so when you enjoy what you're doing, whatever it is, you're gonna you're gonna do good at it. You're gonna do well at it. All right. I gotta tell you, man. I have a hard time picturing you as a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> with the white I do I had a white lab coat which I never wore but I did have it um, yeah it was it was uh, well I'll tell you this is and the, we also talked a little bit in, in the previous episode with Mike about having people around you and, and telling you what's going on and Mike has his mm -hmm. community now with his with his self storage people but I remember my, my boss t actually told me he's like I don't I don't picture you as being a scientist but I was like at that point I already had a master's I'm like I'm not dropping out I'm gonna finish my PhD and we'll see what happens but like to to your point like um having having other people around you and mike has this community of people uh and so if this is something that you think it might interest you you want to learn more about it i would strongly suggest going through mike's free seven day course uh, and and i i've gone through it myself and it's actually it's really good it, it truthfully is really really good um and it'll give you more of a taste as, as to whether or not this is something you want to investigate um maybe it is maybe it's not but you, you got to kind of dip your toes in the water at least to find out whether it's you know something that might interest you um and so i'm yeah i'm great I'm grateful for Mike for sharing this because it's just one more vehicle. And I love what he says too. He says, life in my vision is the roadmap and storage is the vehicle for the life I want to live. Yeah, I think that's a good answer for this particular episode. That's it. So listen, everyone, if you enjoyed this, please leave us uh, some ratings, some reviews. We'd love to hear from you. Subscribe, tell your friends about it, tell your family, tell your neighbors, tell everyone we're trying to get this life in your show uh, really uh, reaching a lot of people because uh, we believe in the message and we think it changes lives. And so thank you for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. And until then... Live life. Uh, I don't know what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, go again. Yeah, we'll see you next time. <laughs>